Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, may you know the true peace of being God's children, knowing that it is not about what you know, but that He knows you. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending your Son, Christ Jesus, into our world. That He is wisdom, that He has taken on flesh, that He is the Word incarnate. Help us each day to celebrate His presence among us, the joy He gives us, the promise of our salvation. Lord, fill us with peace not only at this time as we, as we prepare to move into the Epiphany season, but also with peace throughout this year, knowing that you are with us, that you are our guide and our stay. May we truly look to you with fear and amazement, knowing you are our great God. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From 1965 to 1970, there was a t show on television, which was quite a bit before my time, called Get Smart. Maybe some of you saw this show. I, don't know, I won't ask you if you saw it in its original airing. But for me, it was already well within reruns. Get Smart I was uh, on, and I was watching Agent 86 grabbing his, well, predated the cell phone at that point, but maybe you remember he had a shoe, and he'd pick up his shoe, and his phone was in his shoe. And if you remember... There were two main characters. There was Agent 86, Maxwell Smart, and Agent 99. And they were part of a group called Control. That was a U.S. agency, and, the, and they said the letters never stood for anything, but they always combated the evil of the group known as Chaos, the terrorist group who tried to bring about terror among the people. Well, maybe if you remember the show, you also remember the way that Agent 86 behaved. Maybe you remember the way that he kind of solved his cases. He was a, maybe a bit of a spoof, a mockery of James Bond, because he seemed to stumble into solving his, the cases, didn't he? He seemed to be a bit of a bumbler, bumbler, right? He seemed to lack a bit of common sense. It was not that he wasn't intelligent, he was a bright guy, but he seemed to lack common sense. He seemed to lack good sense. And maybe some of you know people like that. You know people in this world who, they're, they're amazingly bright. They're brilliant. They're intelligent. They seem to be able to know if you have a math problem, they can solve it like that. If you have a complex formula, they can figure it out. If you need a fact from history or from the stars, they can tell you. But when it comes to day-to-day -day life, they haven't a clue. And sometimes it makes us laugh a little bit, but it seems to me that some of that, what was at one time common sense, has become much more good sense and less common. And said uncommon sense. But thankfully, we're, we're given a book like the book of Proverbs. Now the book of Proverbs, as many of you know, was, was written by Solomon. Solomon wrote this book, and as you go through it, it seems like a lot of the things that he writes should be obvious to us, but maybe in this uncommon sense world, maybe they don't make as much sense. He says things like, well, one of my favorite Proverbs, it comes to, it's, Train up a child in the way he shall go, and when he grows old, he shall not depart in it. The true promise of God that if you teach your children the Scripture, if you teach, teach them the Word, if you not only teach them but show them the ways, hopefully then they will also follow in that faithfulness towards God. Or maybe another one that some of you are aware of is Proverbs chapter 26, where, where Solomon says that uh, like a dog returns to a vomit, to its vomit, so will a fool return to his folly. How often do we get caught up in Bad habits. Things that we keep going back to even though we know they are not good for us. No, the book of Proverbs is filled with all this advice that Solomon gives us. and I've often jested to people that if only Solomon would have taken his own advice. If only he would have read those, book, those Proverbs that he wrote actually for his son. He wrote those book of Proverbs so that his son Rehoboam would actually learn how to rule the kingdom. The problem was, for Solomon was he did not stay following those words that he wrote, those Proverbs. And even before we get there, though, let's go back to the setting that brings about Solomon's wisdom. Today in 1 Kings chapter 3, we started in verse 5, but if we would have started a little bit sooner, we would have discovered that Solomon was actually going to Gibeon, which was a place of one of the high places. It was one of those places where people went to worship not only the true God, but would go to worship false gods. They would go up there and they would worship right alongside worshiping Yahweh. They'd also worship Baal and Molech and they worship Ashtaroth. And, and well, you don't know maybe all those god, gods and goddesses. They were idols. They were false gods. And that's where Solomon was going. In fact, in Gibeon, he was going to offer a thousand sacrifices, not necessarily in praise for wisdom to God, but actually because he had just signed his first alliance. 
his first alliance with the nation of, of, of Egypt. He married the, uh, the Pharaoh's daughter, and so he offered these sacrifices as a political joining together. But when the Lord came to him, the Lord looked upon him with favor. And the Lord, and Solomon loved the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, right before this, it says Solomon loved the Lord and walked in the statutes of David his father. And the Lord blessed, it, it blessed Solomon with that wisdom because of David's faithfulness. Because where, where Solomon started out, he started out following the Lord. He started out trusting in Him. He started out with true wisdom because he asked the Lord for wisdom, guidance, discernment. He started out desiring a right relationship with God. But as his Proverbs so often remind us, as Paul says outright, good company corrupts bad character. And how true that is for Solomon after he chased after many more political alliances, after he chased after many more wives and garnered more concubines, he no longer desired that right relationship with God. Even though he was the wisest man, maybe one of the wisest men, if not the wisest man of the time, he still did not have the wisdom to have faith. He still did not, not have true wisdom. He had extended the borders of Israel he built the temple for the Lord. He formed those political alliances, but he did not have wisdom. He did not have understanding of who the Lord was. That sense that should have been common to him, that sense that the Lord who came to him, who spoke to him, who gave him the gift of wisdom and knowledge, he didn't have the common sense to follow that Lord, the true God. And it would seem like we could easily point fingers at Solomon and we can easily judge him for how far he strayed, how quickly he strayed. But it's only easier to point the fingers because then we don't think about ourselves. We don't think about the ways that we have sought worldly wisdom instead of true wisdom in God. So often we seek after knowledge, understanding. And some knowledge and understanding is good. That's why we have teachers to instruct the next generation. That's why we go to school and that's why we learn. But knowledge and understanding cannot teach faith. And so often we try to believe that that's the case. So often we believe that knowledge and understanding, if we have just enough, we'll be able to know the Lord. But that's not the case. And even among Christian circles, we see this desire. This desire to make it about our decision, our understanding. This desire to make it about our amount of knowledge. But no amount of knowledge ever brings salvation. No amount of understanding of God, because truly we can't understand God, can we? How many of you understand God? No, I didn't think so. Me neither. But we want that understanding. We want to believe that we can do something. That it can be some way our knowledge. So that somehow we can decide that the Lord is our Lord. But the truth is we cannot. The truth is this comes from our sinful pride, our sinful desire, our sinful hearts that, that want to have some role in salvation. Paul's very clear. Ephesians chapter 2, that, that, we would, that no one has done anything that no man may boast. But he, he even says it more clearly. If we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, not only do we not know the Lord apart, well, apart from His Holy Spirit, but we reject the Lord apart from His Holy Spirit. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. It is only by the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and truly, only the Holy Spirit can create faith in us. That is His job. As we read in, in, in Luther's explanation of the third article, that is one of the main roles of the Spirit, is to teach us who God is, to teach us faith in our hearts. But so often, we seek after these desires on our own. So often, we want it to be our own wisdom, because then we have control. We want to be masters of our own destiny, even so far as to be our own gods. Now, I don't think any of you would ever say that, but there are certainly some neuroscientists out there who do say so. There were some studies that were conducted in the, in the, in the mid-90s, about 95 and 96, where these neuroscientists studied religious experiences, not just Christian religious experiences, but the re religious experience of Buddhists and of Hindus and of, all, of religions around the world. And they noticed, as they studied the brain, neuroscience studies the brain, they noticed that the chemicals in your brain would change when you had a religious experience. They believed that eventually they could re reproduce that by using medicines and drugs and reproduce this knowledge 
so that we wouldn't need God. So that the chemical changes in our brain would give us that same religious experience. The truth is, our faith is more than experience. It's more than knowledge. The truth about our faith is it's true, it's wisdom of the Lord that He gives to us by the working of His Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives. Paul says in Romans, and I ask that you bear with me a little bit because it's a little longer quote, but he actually says that we have no excuse. That all people have been given this promise. That all people have been shown the way. But some of us, we turn our back. We seek after that worldly wisdom instead. This is Paul from Romans chapter 1. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and His divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. I know it's a bit of a longer quote there, but did you hear what Paul told us there? God told us through Paul that, that He has given us all knowledge that we need, all wisdom that we need. The problem is, is we seek after this worldly wisdom and it only points to our judgment. It only points us to the law. It only points us to death and to our failures. It shows us how unholy we are and how holy our Lord is. It shows us how far apart we are. And that's why we're reminded that true wisdom does not come in knowledge, but it comes in the fear of the Lord. Solomon wrote, I don't think any truer words than his words in Proverbs 9.10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Truly it is knowing wisdom, knowing Jesus Christ, our Savior, and knowing the, how much we needed His salvation for us. Truly it is knowing that wisdom that God sent from on high, His Son, to take our place because we are sinners. We are people who have failed. And we are people who, well, our God is righteous. We are wholly unrighteous. But thanks be to God that He has sent wisdom from on high, Jesus Christ, to be our salvation. That He has sent Jesus to take our place. That He has sent Jesus that we might look at our God with fear and amazement. That we might look at our God and not only, not only look at Him and know Him as our, our loving Father, but know Him as the Almighty God who has created this heavens and this earth, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, whose knowledge is beyond our understanding, but whose knowledge includes knowing the very count of hairs on your head. Who knows the amount of beats your heart makes. Who knows the, your innermost thoughts and your innermost heart. Who knows you so intimately that not even your husband or wife, your mom or your dad knows you. God knows you. God knows you and He has given you His love and to know Him. He's given you His words so that you too might follow Him. And as I told the children, it's, it's not a hard faith that we have to receive. It's not about the amount of knowledge we have. But simple faith. Jesus says to His disciples, Truly I say to you, unless you, you turn and become like children... You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Simple faith. Simple faith is not about the amount of words that we say, but it's true belief in our hearts. It's true trust in God and letting go of the world. It's truly saying that we cannot control our lives, but let God's will be done. Not my will, O Lord, but Thy will be done in our lives and trusting in Him. True wisdom is fear of the Lord. It's looking to our Lord and knowing that while we don't understand everything, He is in control of all things. True wisdom is knowing that our Lord came, took on human flesh, paid our price, and has given us the promise of eternal life. That is the true wisdom that He has given to us through His Son, Jesus. That is the true wisdom that He has promised us and the true wisdom that we have in our hearts now. And there are a lot of ways out there that talk about gaining understanding, gaining discernment. And it's important that we learn. It's important that we learn God's Word. It's important that we study it. It's important that we spend time together and struggle over it together. 
But true wisdom only comes in the creating of faith by the Holy Spirit. True wisdom only comes by the Holy Spirit moving in our hearts and our lives to reveal to us that salvation through Christ Jesus. True wisdom is the wisdom that we have knowing that we will be with our Lord forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you have made us your sons and daughters. That you have made us your very own. That is not about what we know or who we know or or even the amount of facts or trust that we have, but it is about your trust that your love for us, that you that your mercy for us and that you have entrusted us with faith. Lord, we pray that each day that you would walk in our lives, that you would move in our hearts, that, that you would forgive us for those times when we have trusted the wisdom of the world, the, the facts that we have. So often those facts, they lead away from you. Return us to your word where we know truth. Return us to your, to re- send your spirit to us again, that we may again walk in the newness of life, that we may again trust in you, that we may know with full wisdom and knowledge our salvation comes through Christ alone. Help us each day to live in that faith, to live in that assurance, to know your love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.